Okay, hello. Hello, everybody. I'm Francesc Campoy. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, welcome to the Go on the Night celebration. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thanks so much for coming, because I know that many of you said yes and then realized that to this, this weekend was Burning Man and then disappeared. <laughs> so, uh, for those that are here, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we will be live streaming the event, which is cool. Uh, also means that hello, everybody on, hello, uh, on YouTube. Uh, if you have a question, please wait for me to bring you a mic. Otherwise, no one will know what you asked. So please wait for me to bring the mic. Uh, Today we're going to have three talks. I will start by giving a talk on the state of Go. We're going to cover a little bit everything that is new with Go 1.9. I gave this talk some time ago. I changed it a little bit since then. Uh, I will cover things like outages from Cloudflare and stuff, uh, which is something we fixed, so that's good. Uh, then we will have another talk by uh, Prashant Varanasi from Uber. He will be talking about uh, flame graphs, which are super cool. And he's going to be explaining how to use them. And then at the end, Peter Bergen will talk about how to do things. <laughs> That's his talk, not mine. So <laughs> cool. So uh, at the end, we will have extra time for socializing and everything. In between the talks, we'll have Q&A. But since we are on live stream, I will try to keep it on, on uh, schedule as much as possible, which means that at some point, I will cut you. I will cut your questions, not you personally. Uh, so <laughs> I will cut your questions. So do not feel like it's something personal. You can ask as many questions as you want afterwards. We'll have more beer and pizza for all of you. Cool. OK, so that said, let's add that. That is not my talk. Wait a second. This is the kind of thing you're supposed to do before. There you go. OK. So we're going to be talking about Go 1.9. Uh, Go 1.9, which was released yesterday. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Uh, we said it would be released in August. So that was still August. That's good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it counts. It's totally fine on time, basically. Uh, and there's a bunch of things in them. I will not cover all of the things that we added to, uh, to the language, even, because some of the changes are actually very uh, hard to explain. And basically, not everyone cares about them. So what I want to try to do is choose the ones that I personally care the most about and the ones that I think the more people might be impacted by. Uh, there may be things that I will not cover. Feel free to ask questions about those at the end. So uh, yeah, released yesterday, which is very good. We have changes to the language. We actually have two changes to the language, but I will cover only one of them, because the other one, I'm actually not even sure I understand it exactly, because it is very, it's about how to compute things with floats, and technically, I do not care about that. Uh, but <laughs> if you want to read it, it is interesting, it, and if, it's something that impacts you. I want to talk to you, because I want to understand what's the impact. Uh, but there's, some, there's one change to the language that we will cover, which is interesting, and I really, I'm really excited about it. Then we'll talk about some of the things that were added to the standard library, some of the things that were changed in the standard library. We'll also talk about the runtime, the tooling, and we'll end up with the community. So changes to the language. Type aliases. Uh, I don't know how many of you were at GopherCon uh, last month. OK, so there was a lot of talks about type aliases, what they are, and what they exist. Uh, basically, type aliases are a tool that exists because there's many people that have huge code bases where a refactor cannot be done atomically, which means that at some point, you cannot force every single user of your library to change their code at the same time. This is not a problem for constants. This is not a problem for variables. This is not a problem for functions. But it is a problem for types. So that's why we created this concept of type aliases. So the whole idea is that this enables Go. The, this enables you to do prog uh, gradual uh, code repairs progressively. Right? So at every single point of those changes, all of your code base will still compile, which is important. Uh, so how do we do it? 
Ross Gotsborough uh, wrote a very good article. Uh, it's in the, I will share the link on uh, later. Actually, I forgot to add the link to the links. But yeah, this is online, so don't worry. Uh, basically, what we do is when we want to create a new API or to migrate one API from point A to point B, what you do is first you create B, then you move all of the users of B, uh, uh, all of the users of A to use B, and once all of them have migrated, then you can drop A, right? That's how you do it. So with type aliases, you can do this for all of the identifiers that you can define in Go. Um, so yeah, bunch of code reapers in the middle. This is because once you've created your new API, you cannot just force everyone to just migrate to the new API. You can do this at Google, because we have one repo, just one, and good tooling. But if you, if you try to force that to all of the users of your API across GitHub, that's going to be lots of fun. Good luck with that. And it will never happen. So that's why we're, uh, uh, we're creating this extra complexity to the language, but that has actually a lot of value. If you want to learn more, shameless plug, I'm actually going to release a video exactly about this. And it's like 20 minutes of me explaining why type aliases are a thing. This talk will be 20 minutes, so I do not have time to, <laughs> to cover the whole thing. So it will be on Monday. Just check it out. It's just for funk, with a C, like funk function. Yeah. Uh, there was also another change. Quaternions uh, that were added to the language as a joke. Um, it was for April 1st. Crazy thing is that uh, Matthew Demsky actually implemented the whole thing. So he, changed, he sent the PRs to, to add these quaternions, which is, I'm not very sure, because I'm not that good in algebra, but I think it's some kind of high dimensional matrix. matrix. And he implemented this in Go. So if you feel like having fun and want to read something, it's a good read. Uh, it was closed and rejected, unfortunately. OK, let's talk about now the standard library. The, langu the language, we've covered the changes. So what about the standard library? Many of you ha might have written some code like this, where you call uh, start time dot now, and then you do something. And once you're done with that something, you ask how long it's been since then, right? So if you run this. In this case, something expensive is three seconds, which is very expensive. So it says three seconds in a little bit. Now, this code was wrong until go under nine. This code was wrong because when you had a clock reset, uh, you could actually have negative time. And this never happens, except for December 31st, 2016, when we had a spare second and we moved our clocks one second back. And this doesn't impact anyone, right? Well, uh, Cloudflare had a little bit of an outage because of this. Because uh, some of their timings all of a sudden were negative, and their programs were, of course, not used to handling like, negative time, which means that all of a sudden they started getting panics. So uh, since then, this has been fixed. So now this code is actually correct, so just keep on using it. And this is actually my favorite change to go under 9, because you do not need to know anything about it. Um, there's no new API. Everything that was implemented is completely hidden from you. Everything just works. There's one tiny little side effect to this, which is if you're comparing time.time .time values, uh, there's one extra non-exported field that you're not seeing that will be taken into account under your comparison if you use equals equals. So do not do that. Use the method equals of the type time. That's the way to do it. OK. I did this poll a long time ago. And I'm going to repeat this, because I think it's still really good. Um, so I asked a long time ago, without looking, how many packages will be added to the standard library with Go 1.9? And 57% said that we're removing one. And I feel like they were trolling me. I'm almost sure, but not completely. Because it is kind of weird that, like, of course, we cannot remove any packages because that would actually break the go 1.9 uh, backwards comp compatibility. But somehow they said that that was the expected result. 
So no, we're not removing any package, which is good. We're actually adding one. Does anyone know which one it is? Bits, math bits. So math bits is a new package, and uh, it comes with a bunch of functions. Basically, they allow you to uh, do things with the binary encoding of numbers. And why is this? Bye. Why is this? OK. <laughs> why is this a package? Right? Like, uh, we've insisted a lot that we should not add new things to the standard library. Rather than adding things to the standard library, what we should do is provide packages that are outside. So why is this something that counts zeros and ones part of the package, part of the standard library? This is actually because uh, we care about this being very efficient. The implementation of this uh, actually will use specific uh, machine language instructions for the uh, platforms that they that are available. So this means that this will be way faster than anything you could write, unless you were also writing something using assembly. assembly. So that's why this exists. Um, it is pretty simple, but if you need to handle bits, now you know you have a package for that. Another example of something that was added to the standard library, and uh, it was for a very good reason, is sync.map. Sync.map is a new implementation of a map. Now, this map is something that is used to be concurrently. Uh, you will know that maps are not to be used concurrently unless you're protecting them with a mutex or something like that. This one does not require to be protected. It just already has all the mutexes inside, and it's safe to use with many go routines at the same time. This was created in order to have a map that was easy to access by many different go routines and that had a stable set of keys. So if you have something where you're adding and removing keys all of the time, this will not be that efficient for you. If it's something where you add some set of keys and then that set of keys is pretty stable and what you're doing is just accessing from many different parts, this will be exactly what you want. Again, why is this part of the standard library? Because we need it in the standard library. And the standard library cannot depend on things that are outside of it. So that's why. We, uh, we use this from many other places inside. Uh, it must not be copied, too, so you should use pointers. And I feel like this, at some point, will be a vet rule that we'll warn you about, but not for now. So. so now you can do something like this, where, as you can see, I have three different go routines and just storing a counter. And I'm doing all of this. Uh, and every second or so, I print how many, uh, what is the value for every counter. And I do this without using any mutex at all. And if I run it with the uh, race detector enabled, it will still work. It will not crash, because this is actually correct code. If you were doing the same thing with a simple map, this would definitely crash. OK. One more thing that has changed is uh, before you were able to write this code, and now it will not work because I'm in running go on the 9 already, so this will not work. Uh, <laughs> but in this case, we were able to use. Uh, HTML escapers inside of a template, which actually allowed you to do HTML injections instead of HTML, which was a very hard way to basically uh, hack yourself. Because, uh, I mean, this code that no, you're not getting that code from outside. But it was a way to create code that it was actually dangerous. You could do like JavaScript injection inside of your HTML page and stuff like that. Since then, we're actually forbid to use HTML and all of the other uh, escapers inside of templates. So if you have any code that did this, it will panic. And this is because it was not safe anyway. So if you run this now, you will see it couldn't execute this, because it found the predefined uh, escaper HTML that it's specifically disallowed. This is new. It might panic. If it does, um, you had a security issue before. So you know now you don't have a security issue. You just have a, pro a program that doesn't run. <laughs> Probably better. 
Okay, this one is something that is super subtle, and that it's also something that I expected. Like I thought that this was already the case since the beginning. But if you have this program here, and uh, you, what I'm doing is okay. I'm checking what is the value that I'm passing, and I'm getting that from the from the environment. So in here I'll check. Okay, what is the value for foo in my environment? Print that. So if I do bufar, uh, foo equals bar, give me the value of foo, it prints bar. Cool. Basically, echo a little bit fancier. So what happens if I do os environment plus foo equals new bar, and then I pass also a variable? Which one do I get? The one that I set in that line right before I call the com command? or the other one that was from the external environment. Do I get both? Which one do I get? It's actually kind of complicated. I personally would expect to get this one, new bar, because the one that I said, the last one. But that was not the case before. You get the first one, which means that there was super weird bugs. Uh, so that has been fixed. And now, so yeah, people were like, new bar, that's what I expect. This is my new MacBook, people. <laughs> this is what it does. Uh, so uh, I also did a pull, and I was like, OK, so what do you expect to get? Do you get bar, new bar, or something weird? And people were like, new bar, of course. That was not the case, but it is now. Now it's what people expect, which is good. So yeah, if you run this, you get the expected result. OK, it's way more changes than this on the library. Uh, but we don't have time to cover all of them, so we're going to move into the runtime. So is the runtime faster? Yes, ish. Um, it is faster for most of the things, but I didn't. We don't have uh, official benchmarks, so I did this benchmark on my laptop personally and run it once. So, <laughs> exactly, right? Like, it is supposed to be faster, and I'm sure it's faster, but I'm not sure because of this. I'm sure because of my trust in the Go team more than the trust in this benchmark. But yeah, it is, it is faster than go1.8.1. I didn't try it with go1.8.3, but you can, uh, you can do it yourself and you'll see it. Uh, for the garbage collector, there's some changes. Uh, there's the new alg algorithm for large object allocation, uh, and which means that we have a better performance for larger heaps. Uh, this, when I come here, and I lost it. Where? No. Oh. Oh, I do not like the present tool, uh, just so you know. OK, so <laughs> uh, I did this some time ago. Uh, it was with Go1.8. I made these slides where we show uh, the performance. So with tweets, because tweets are better. Uh, so this was Go1.5, right? So we went Go1.4 was something like, 300, I'm going to hope for milliseconds. I cannot read it, but I'm going to hope for milliseconds. 300 milliseconds of uh, garbage collection pause. This was go on the 4. With go on the 5, we went down to around 30. So 300 to 30, nice. Then go on the 5 to one, go on the 6, we went to from around 40 to 4. Um, The good thing is this guy keeps on tweeting. <laughs> so we can just go to the tweet and see that this was from 1.6 to 1.7. And we went, yeah, so from uh, around 20 to 4. Go 1.7 to go 1.8. We went down to around a little bit less than 1. And you're expecting to be like, like, like nanoseconds now. Uh, now it's the same. <laughs> but I mean, it's pretty fast, to be honest. So I'm like, I also expected, like, we're, are we going to get like 0 0.1? But no, which is like same speed, which is good. Um, another thing that we've had a lot of effort on, and it's not visible and nobody cares about yet is the fact that we're emitting uh, way better information for Dwarf. 
So uh, dwarf is the information that we add into a binary in order to identify all of the things that that binary contains. And this is the thing that uh, tools like the debuggers use in order to understand what your program does. Uh, we've been adding more and more and more in order to get GCC, uh, uh, sorry, GDB to understand Go better. We're still not 100% there, but the idea is that we're going to keep on trying to do better. So uh, not only uh, GDB, but also Delve can do a better job at debugging Go. On top of that, there's many other tools that also use this information. So uh, he'll be talking about flame graphs. Uh, flame graphs are one of these things that also use this kind of information. The tracer also uses this kind of information. There's a lot of different tools that allow us to understand better our programs that depend on this dwarf information. So even though it's something that most people do not see, this is actually one of the biggest things that we've changed during Go 109. So it's a pretty important thing. Cool. Let's go to the tooling, so we talk about tooling. We have better errors. And these errors are like not that much of a huge thing for you, because you write Go. But for people that are new, this is a big difference. Um, if you write this code, right, and I've seen people writing this code in many languages, not Go, before you get, you got an expected semicolon or new line before uh, the opening brace. If you show this to a person that has never written Go before, they're like, what? Where? Where is the semicolon, right? It's not very weird, not very clear. Now, it will actually also tell you missing function body for main. We cannot do better than that because syntaxes are complicated. But at least now it shows you that oh, we like the function main is completely empty. And by the way, this is weird on the bottom. So we're trying to improve a little bit. I still dream of something like JS hint or JS glint that will actually give you very very detailed and specific errors for newcomers that will help them understand go better. But we're still not there. Also. A uh, long time ago, uh, we translated Go from uh, the Go compiler from C to Go. And since then, we've been working on making that code base look more like actual Go. Uh, one of the good things about Go, as we all know, is concurrency. And we've actually applied concurrency to the compiler. Before, the compiler was able to compile different files concurrently. Now, inside of a single file, it will also compile different functions concurrently. So if you have big files with a lot of functions, you will see a big difference, especially if you have more than one core. If you don't have more than one core, it might be slower. But who does have less than one core nowadays, less than eight? Uh, so this will be faster. Um, I've seen some, uh, some uh, benchmarks showing those like 20% faster in some of the things. But to be honest, I do not believe those benchmarks either. So I do not put them here. But it should be faster. One more thing, go test. Go test added one more little flag, go test uh, dash test dot list. What does this do? It lists the test that it's going to run. And this seems like, OK, why do I care? This is actually very important to be able to write tooling around tests. Uh, otherwise, the only way to know what tests you're going to run is to run them. So uh, yeah. T dot run. Oh, yeah, so this will include subtests. Uh, is that a question? Yeah, yeah, this will include subtests. So I have not tried them, but like, I'm like 99% sure that it will actually include subtests. That's a very good question that we should try. Yes, we'll check it out later. <laughs> um, GoDoc also added a way to add links to fields in structs until now. You, uh, not only in structs, also in interfaces, I'm pretty sure. Uh, until now, if you had like HTTP client, HTTP client has a lot, of, a lot of fields, and you want to point to a specific one, and it says HTTP client. Good luck. Find it there. Uh, now you're able to actually point to client transport. So if you click there, it points to transport. Well, until you refresh. What did it do? OK, I, I'm going to click it again, and you'll be impressed. There you go, transport. <laughs> so this is pretty good. Uh, before, it was very hard to understand where people were pointing out. Oh, yeah. So that was actually introducing Go 1.8, but I like it a lot, and I didn't notice until now. So <laughs> that's why I'm talking about it now. 
but it was the previous version. And way more changes. Uh, there's actually a huge amount of changes uh, on PPROF specifically. There's an EUI. There's a bunch of changes also on the tracer. There's a lot of things, spe specifically on the tooling side of things. There's a huge, uh, huge effort on making Go more, I think the word is like uh, corporate oriented. Like people want to use it for real in production and they need a lot of tooling around it. We're doing a huge effort on it, uh, and not only the Go team, but also the whole community. Uh, so we're trying to get it more into uh, where all the languages are. Even though the tracer, I don't know any other language that has something as good as the Go tracer. So, OK, so we're going to finish with the community. Um, we have a lot of meetups. Uh, we have the Go meetups uh, page that I maintain. It's running on a, on a pension, which is I do not really maintain it. It just runs. Uh, but uh, that 136 was 108 a uh, couple of months ago. So it keeps on growing really fast, which is very nice. Uh, we're working on something that we will announce very soon on how to get all of these people, all of these meetups, to work together more efficiently. Uh, that will be announced soon, so I'm not going to say more about it, but very excited about that. Uh, one of my favorite organizations, I had to update this. Today, because it said 18 from a couple months ago, now it's 24, which is huge, because that's like uh, one third of growth in two months, which I don't know how they're doing it, but congratulations to women who go. It's amazing. I didn't update the map, so if you're taking pictures of the map, it is not updated. <laughs> and also, we have a bunch of conferences coming up. Um, there will be DocGo in, uh, so we just finished uh, Golan UK. Anyone that went to Golan UK? No? OK, I didn't go either. Uh, this dog go will be in Paris in November. I will be there. Uh, go for Con Brazil in November too, 11 days later. And I will also be there. And then go for Con Denver. Uh, the dates were announced already. It will be in August in Denver. It's going to be really hot. And that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs>